It is a real joy to be with you to speak about and with things and a subject and people that I love, to speak in the legacy of and celebration of, though I would never dare to say preaching like Martin Lloyd-Jones, and to do it in the very place where he gave these famous lectures 50 years ago, and to do it with you all is a great joy, so thank you, John, for inviting me here, and it was uh, several, several years ago now that I gave some preaching lectures, so I did look through there and try, trying not to say the same thing that I said, but it was eight years ago, so I don't even remember what I said, and you certainly won't remember what I said, or, nor were you here. It's an honor to speak about Martin Lloyd-Jones, but more importantly tonight, a little bit about him, but in the spirit of Lloyd-Jones, to think together about the primacy of expository preaching. You will hear, no doubt, from many of the speakers some of their own encounters with the doctor. I remember I was a college student, and there was a, a friend of a friend who had found these books, very nice, attractive, hardcover books by this publisher, Banner of Truth. And he said, whatever Christian books you're reading now, Kevin, you need to read these books by the banner. And he said, you need to read this Martin Lloyd-Jones. Well, not knowing anything about how Welsh names work, the first thing I thought is, he's got a hyphenated name. This guy's a liberal. Where did this guy come from? But not the case. And so I first read his book on the Puritans and was riveted by this history, uh, uh, some of which I knew, but most of which I, I didn't as a, a young man. I may have even been still a teenager at the time. And then from there, read some of his evangelistic sermons from his ministry in Wales. And then I don't remember if spiritual depression was after that or sermons on the Mount, studies on the Sermon on the Mount, but preaching and preachers. And I remember very distinctly where I was sitting at the round kitchen table, a uh, student at Hope College in Holland, Michigan, at Van Zyl Cottage, they're all named after Dutch people there, reading, preaching, and preachers. And I was already on a track thinking that I felt a call to pastoral ministry, and that book cemented to me. I, I had not felt anything like that sense of the wonder, and even the word Lloyd-Jones uses, the romance of preaching, it, it hit me with a force. This is what I want to do, and I want to do it something like this man is laying out here in these lectures. I've read the book several times since then. It's one of the few books that I make a point to go back and try to reread and find inspiration from, and it's right at the top of my list if somebody says, give me a book on preaching. In fact, I will tell my students in pastoral ministry, it's not, this isn't a biblical test, it's not foolproof, but I will say, if you can read Preaching and Preachers by the Doctor and not feel your heart and soul and mind stirred to preach, then I question whether you have a call to preach. Now, as I've reread Preaching and Preachers a number of times, I've, I think, matured a little bit to come to the conclusion that as wonderful it is, you can't possibly, no one should try to agree with everything that the doctor says. He was dogmatic about everything. You could make a list of the number of practices in preaching that count as prostitution, there are many of them, gestures, looking at gestures, all sorts of, a number of things. Uh, I remember in one of his books going on a rant about the, uh, probably against the English, I imagine, and how some of them were bathing more than once a week. So he had many dogmatic views. You can't possibly agree with all of them. And yet, there is so much there that stirs and calls to this wonder and this glory of preaching, which did not start, of course, with the doctor or with our heroes from the awakening or from the reformation, but goes back to the apostles and to the Lord Jesus, even before him, to the Jewish tradition that he inherited. It's not some sort of modern invention. I remember when I was candidating at my previous church, I was all of 
25, 26 years old, and they had a candidating weekend, and there was there at a coffee house with the men of the church and just sort of a mingle meet and greet before they asked me some questions, and a young man who was a PhD student in English literature, I may connect the dots with that later, but he said to me, now, Kevin, if you come here, are you going to continue with this monological, hierarchical, enlightenment, modernistic, monodirectional style of communication? Or are you more open to dialogical, postmodern, less hierarchical, conversational modes of discourse? And I said, this was from the Lord, I think, I said, if you mean, am I going to speak for 45 minutes while you listen? Yeah, that's what I intend to do. <laughs> and he left the church. <laughs> But of course, that kind of preaching is not an invention of the modern world or the enlightenment. It came from Judaism, which developed and refined the practice of exegesis and expositional preaching. Hughes Oliphant Old in his magisterial series on the history of reading and preaching of Holy Scripture says, we know that in the time of Jesus, the Torah, the law of Moses, was regularly read and preached in worship this was the cardinal characteristic of Jewish worship. And we see this in beginning form in the Old Testament. The Levites were to teach Israel the law, Deuteronomy 33.10. The true priest was a teaching priest, 2 Chronicles 15.3. We see the same development in the New Testament. We know John the Baptist preached. Jesus said he came out to preach. You will not find a single example in the Gospels of Jesus going into another town in order to set up an exorcism booth or a healing clinic. Now, he did both of those things, and they were signs of his ministry, powerful sign. But his explicit purpose for coming out in ministry, Mark chapter 1, was that he might preach. And we see it with the apostles, considered the word such a full-time job that they appointed other men full of the Holy Spirit to care for the physical needs of the church in Acts chapter 6. No matter what the world says, the congregation may say, or if we're honest, and some of you are preachers as I am, no matter what our own hearts may tell us, full of many doubts, we must have confidence in the preaching of the Word. Lloyd-Jones says at the beginning of those lectures, ultimately, my reason for being ready to give these lectures is that to me, the work of preaching is the highest and greatest and the most glorious calling to which anyone can ever be called. If you want something in addition to that, I would say without any hesitation that the most urgent need in the Christian church today is true preaching. And as it is the greatest and most urgent need in the church, it is obviously the greatest need of the world also. Is that obvious to you, to me, that the greatest need in the church and therefore in the world is this preaching of the Word of God? Do you believe that? Some of you have that as your awesome responsibility. Others of you are training for that awesome responsibility. And you will often, if you're anything like me, leave on Sunday after shaking many hands and coming down with this cold that I did on Monday morning from shaking all those hands and feel like, did that do anything? Was that a, was that a waste? Was God doing anything? Was it more words? And how many sermons have these people been subject to? Before they were subject to mine, they were subject to Harry Readers right here in that same church. They've had good preaching, and now they have to put up with me. You will feel that. Do you have confidence in the Word of God to do the work of God? Lloyd-Jones says, we are here to preach the Word. That is the first thing. The priorities are laid down once and forever. This is the primary task of the church, the primary task of the leaders of the church, the people who are set in this position of authority, and we must not allow anything to deflect us from this, however good the cause, however great the need. This is surely the direct answer to much of the false thinking and reasoning concerning these matters at the present time. 
the necessity of preaching. But my specific task is not this evening to convince you of the need for preaching and hope you are convinced of that already and will be stirred to it in these messages throughout these days. But rather, I want to talk, and my assignment is to speak specifically about expository preaching. Now, we could spend the whole lecture trying to define and going through the definitions of expository preaching. Let me give you a very simple street-level definition. Expository preaching gives people the meaning of the text and what to do with it. Expository preaching, now there's a whole lot you could do and uh, you could find a way to get the Trinity in there, and a lot of important things, but very simple. Expository preaching gives people the meaning of the text and what to do with it. All right, Kevin, do you have any Bible verses that suggest that? I do. Turn to Nehemiah chapter 8. This is not an expositional message. I'm not modeling that for you here, but this famous text from Nehemiah gives us already in the Old Testament, a clear example of what we would call today expository teaching and preaching. So there in Nehemiah 8, the people are gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. Verse 4, Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform they had made for the purpose, and behind, beside him all of these names of people are there. Verse 5, Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people, and as he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And, go down to verse 8, they read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. That, in a very simple form, is expository preaching, to read the text and give people the sense of it. Yes, there is a meaning in the text. We are not left to a hermeneutical spiral or some sort of interpretive morass. There is a meaning in the text. They read it. They gave it to them. Notice this is in the context of worship, and we don't even have anything that they were singing. There's no organs mentioned or guitars. I'm sure that's in a marginal note somewhere, but it's worship nonetheless because the Word is there present. Expository preaching gives people, verse 8, the sense of it. Now, my definition also says, and then what to do with it, which I think we find suggested in the next paragraph, verse 9. Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and the scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready for this day is holy to our Lord and do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people saying, be quiet for this day is holy, do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and send portions and to make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. Expository preaching is more than that, but it must not be less than that, that people leave Sunday morning and they have understood the words. So we see in the first paragraph, they gave a sense of it. Here in the second paragraph, we see they tell them what to do with it. Now, in that case, they were so struck to the core with the word that was read, feeling grief for how far short they had fallen from God's commands that they were weeping, but then they come around and say, no, no, today is not that day of weeping. Today is a day of rejoicing, for we have heard the word of the Lord, and God is with us, and we will be obedient. We see something similar in Second Chronicles 15. For a long time, Israel was without the true God and without a teaching priest and without the law. But when in their distress they turned to the Lord, the God of Israel, and sought Him, He was found by them. We sometimes think of the priest as just being a kind of butcher and just constantly dealing with sacrifices and blood and guts and altars. And the idea that he would be a teacher was something, well, that's just a New Testament idea. But here, clearly, we see there was a teaching priest. And the result of a good, faithful teaching priest was that the people understood the law and they turned to the Lord and they sought Him. Isn't this the basic model that we see recorded to us in the early church? 
Many of you know this paragraph from Justin Martyr. And on the day called Sunday, all who live in cities or in the country gather together to one place and the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read as long as time permits. Then when the reader has ceased, the president verbally instructs and exhorts to the imitation of these good things. There again, we have the reading of the text, an understanding of it, and an exhortation. So in expository preaching, the people get the sense of what the text means and what to do with it. The early church, because it began as a Jewish church, already had this tradition of expository preaching, which paid careful attention to history, grammar, vocabulary, theological significance, and application. Sometimes lazy Christians, when we don't know how something is bad, we just think of certain big box isms. That's Greek thinking, enlightenment, the Victorians. Those are usually the big, big three. Or we find a way to make what is actually very old seem very new. And in this case, I remember several years ago in the emergent heyday, may emergent rest in peace, uh, people arguing that this, this idea of preaching has nothing to do with the New Testament. Well, it actually has everything to do with the way that they were already worshiping in the synagogue. Again, here's Hughes Oliphant Old. Even more than the careful rendition of sacred music, which was cultivated in both temple and synagogue, the reading and preaching of the scriptures became a matter of highly specialized training. Think of Machen's famous argument that we're trying to make specialists in interpreting and handling the Bible. Old continues, the scriptures were worthy of careful study. They deserved to be handled with competent hands. Their preservation was entrusted to the most intelligent and devout men of the community. All these things belong to what might be called a scriptural piety, recognizing that when God's word was read with clarity and heard with understanding, God was glorified. So Jesus lived in and inherited and passed on this Jewish tradition of expository preaching, to read the text, give people the sense of the text, and exhort them to make the text and its application and its points their own. So here then is the question I want us to consider for the, the next 30 minutes or however much we have left, is to ask ourselves the question, so how are we doing? I would guess with this self-selecting group, you're coming out on a on a rainy evening to celebrate the legacy of Martin Lloyd-Jones. This is a group that's already very much in favor of expository preaching. It's what you want from your pastor. If you're a layperson, it's what you're training to do. If you're a seminary student, it's what you hope you do on Sunday if you're a preacher. And I trust that there are many, many good examples in this area, in this room. And yet, I think on the whole, just thinking of Reformed evangelicalism, I think we have a lot of congregations who say they want expository preaching and a lot of pastors who think they are doing expository preaching when in fact they are not getting nor receiving nor offering expository preaching, or at least not all that it might be. So what I'd like to do to open this conference on a very positive note is give you several reasons that we may, several ways in which we may be failing at expository preaching. So how we may be, if fail, that, that's a hard word, not fail, you know, but C minus, you know, <laughs> come see the professor, you're not kicked out of school, you're not thriving. Let me suggest several ways in which we may not be doing expository preaching as well as we think we are. Number one, this is perhaps most obvious. We read the text for the sermon. We say true things in the sermon, but the true things in the sermon don't really come manifestly from the text of the sermon. This happens in the Lord uses it all over the place. So just be at ease. God has saved many a people with preachers who did not do well in their homiletics class. I remember I, I went to 
different seminary. I had the great Haddon Robinson, who's a great preacher, and uh, I don't preach, you know, his model, but I learned a lot from him, and I remember preaching, and man, you know, the, the homiletics course, you have to, I mean, these, these poor brothers, they have to listen to a lot of bad sermons in life. And I'm sure Haddon Robinson had his share. And I remember doing my little, you know, eight-minute message in class. And he was giving evaluation there in front of, you know, everybody. And he said, that illustration you gave at the end, Kevin, that was better than nothing. His exact words. <laughs> and you know what the response was? They all laughed, just like you did right now. And it's, it's, it's opening the wound again. And he said, no, no, you, you knew that you needed something there. You knew you needed an illustration. And what you came up with, it was better than nothing. <laughs> so, yes, we, we don't all get rave reviews in our preaching classes, and the Lord still uses us. But surely, at the very least, our aim must be to say true things, not only that are true, but that are manifestly true from the passage of Scripture that we are reading Sometimes we think we are automatically doing expository preaching because we are doing Lectio Continua. You know, we're going through consecutively books of the Bible. And yes, it's true. I, I think expository preaching and Lectio Continua go very well hand in glove that the two mutually reinforce one another, that the best way to do one is to do the other, and yet they are not identical. You can be standing up the next Sunday and say, well, last week we were in John chapter 8. This morning, turn to John chapter 9, and you are faithfully going through the different sections in the gospel and not, in fact, be doing expository preaching. Sometimes we preach big themes found in the text more than actually preaching from the text itself. At times, this is because our choice of passage is too small. Now, can I dare to just say one way? in which the doctor may not be a good example for us. And it's not necessarily his fault, as it is our, ours, that he, we, we don't have his set of gifts. So many of us, especially in the Reformed tradition, will look at, you know, he preached for 18 lifetimes on Ephesians 1, and John Piper, he's still preaching on Romans somewhere, probably. He's still <laughs> doing it. And we have these models who just preached and they could just do eight weeks in a row on one verse and we think that is really how to do godly expositional preaching. Very few of us are that interesting, <laughs> that creative, and just to be frank, if you are preaching say, five sermons on one verse, it's likely that you're actually doing more of a topical sermon series. Now, it's not that people, topical sermons, you can't, you know, call your session right now, get him out of here, he did a topical message. But if you're going through, you know, the fruit of the Spirit, and you're going to do one on each of those, that, that's fine. That's not, you're really then doing a message about love all in the Bible, and joy as you see it all in the Bible. So sometimes we have chosen our text so small because we think that's, that's really the model for godliness that we end up preaching themes more than connections in the text itself. Or at other times, it's because our sermons, can I say this, are too long. I was preaching at a Presbyterian church years ago and uh, not my own, and was asking the pastor, how long should I preach on Sunday? And he said, five minutes shorter than you think. <laughs> now, I understand in some contexts where it's, you know, they're used to sermonettes, and we all know John Stott said sermonettes make Christianettes, okay? You're, in your, you're trying to push from 15 minutes up to 18 minutes up to 20 minutes, but I'm talking about the sort of young man who goes out and thinks, if I'm really, really a good preacher... I got to hit 45 minutes, and if I can get up to 55, and I heard Mark Dever, but he's a Baptist, he can get away with it, he does an hour, then it's really, really good. Most of us in this room, and myself included, would be better preachers preaching a little bit shorter, tighter, 
more refined. Sometimes my, my best sermons are those, you know, Christmas Eve, hey, we got a lot of other stuff going on, Pastor. You got 20 minutes. Get to the point. <laughs> it's true. You've heard this axiom before, but it is absolutely true. It takes more time to prepare a shorter message than a longer. I mean, just to, hey, I got a lot of stuff I want to talk to you about for an hour. No, it really, if I had time, I would have distilled it into the 40 minutes that really is hitting the point for this Sunday. So sometimes we go on too long, and when we do that, we've exhausted really what we had to say expositionally from the text, and so we end up with three little mini-sermons. We sort of take a little, you know, there's a word here, we're, it's the word righteousness, and we're going to do a word study and, you know, get the dikaio root, and we're going to do that for a little while. We're going to give a little history of the, the Reformation, and then there's a word <laughs> glory over here, and we're going to talk about kabod and heaviness, and we're going to kind of do that, and... We're giving three sermons because I paid for this seminary and you got to get something out of it. <laughs> and I got Kittle and I just finally learned how to use Logos and do all that sort of stuff. So <laughs> stand back, it's coming. <laughs> now the problem, even if you're saying true things, but people cannot see it manifestly from the text, is they are learning to trust you before the text. Now, you may say, but I'm telling them what's true. That's right. That's good. But not everybody out there will. And who knows what the next pastor will say? So they are not learning to discern the text and to handle the text for themselves. They're learning. Pastor goes away. He gets a lot of stuff. He comes, and then he shares with me. But I didn't see it in this text. So that's one way we can get it wrong. Second, and it's related Second way that we can fail or at least be less than stellar with our expositional preaching is when our best stuff does not come from our closest attention to the text. When our best stuff does not come from our closest attention to the text. Too many preachers, and here I know I have preached sermons like this and will point the finger at myself. Too many preachers are at their best when they are telling a personal anecdote when they're ripping into some sacred cow, when they're getting on a riff, when they have a bit of humor, and I use humor in my sermons, what I tell students, general rule about humor, if you're funny in real life, you might be funny in the pulpit. If you're not funny in real life, don't try. <laughs> you're not going to get funnier coming up here. It's what Spurgeon said, the difference between natural humor and jocularity. But you know the kind of you know, if, you, if, you're, if you're watching a preacher, you know, and he's here and he's handling the text, and then, then he does one of these. It's not bad to move away from the pulpit. That's not, but now maybe what he's going to say is really good, and it's going to be delivering that text right to your heart. I'll say more about that later. But maybe it's, okay, Pastor, this is going to be good. Look up now because Pastor's really going to let it rip. He's going he's gonna, to, I know he's got a rant stored up about something. It's video games this week or it's college football or it's the SEC because I'm down in SEC, ACC country. I always say SEC football is the best football, college football money can buy. That is true. Um, it's for you, Harry. So, is your best stuff from the text? When you get most excited, when you think about, you know, your preaching and you got the, those moments that are really going to fly, do you think, can I make my best point, the one I'm most excited to make, the one I can't wait to deliver, can I make that without any of my hard-fought exegesis from this week? Too often the answer is, well, yes. We must be constrained by what we can sincerely say from the verses before us. It's one of the things that many of you will, will appreciate John Piper's preaching and one of the things that he's modeled so well. And Jason now at Bethlehem models it, it just the same What's exciting there is I see things in the Word. I'm excited about new things and there's problems and there's things that I'm figuring out and God's taught me something new. If we want fresh power from the pulpit, let us labor to demonstrate that our most passionate appeals 
come from the most precise exposition. The best preacher is the preacher who is at his best when he is closest to the text. Now, I do believe in preachers having personality. There's a danger. I'm not an expert on preaching in my own country, let alone another country, but I've, I've, I've spent considerable time and preached lots of times in England and spoken about this with many pastors. And one of the differences often between English preaching and American preaching, um, American preachers are expected to have their personality come out. And with that, I think, are some really good things. You get to know the man. There's a sense of vibrancy and passion. I think that can be a strength of preaching in our context. But the danger is that you can have a man's charisma substitute for a long time with many people careful attention to the text. And what I do find refreshing when I listen to British preaching is I'm much more confident that I'm going to get a well-thought-out exposition, and it's going to be careful attention to the text. I don't know if I'm going to get anything else, but I will get that. And that it is, is what is most important, that our best stuff comes from our closest attention to the text. Here's a third way we can get it wrong or not quite right. People know more about us after the sermon, more about our family, more about our children, more about the movies out there, more about the world they live in than they actually know about the verses that were read for the sermon. Give people the sense of it, Nehemiah says, the understanding. So, yes, I use personal illustrations. Yes, I say funny things about my kids. Yes, I read and try to bring in cultural analysis when appropriate. But I hope that the overwhelming sense is people walk out think, not just, I learned something new about my pastor this week. I really like that. And people do. You can do that kind of preaching that is emotional voyeurism, and people will love it. But you want them leaving not thinking, wow, I understand the cultural milieu we live in much better. No, I understand, first of all, the words and the verses and the paragraphs and the meaning in this text. People should learn something every Sunday from your sermon. Even if you're in a less educated part of the world, country, city, even if you're in a very simple, obvious text. I've been preaching through John off and on and John 3.16. You get to passages like that and you think, oh, what, what am I going to say? Everybody knows John 3.16. But surely there are jewels to find there that your people have not uncovered. There are connections yet to make. There are things for them to learn. When I preached on John 3.16, I focused on what was surprising. And I said, I want you to note it. Now, this is a familiar verse. I said, I want you to, I want you to be surprised by two, two words here. First, the word world. So, for God so loved, everybody gets that. God loves, but I want you to get, he loved the world. And so then you get your exegesis. And you talk about what the world means and the different way John uses the world. And I'm trying to press home. That's surprising. Not that God would love, but he loved the world. And then the second surprising word was whoever. That whoever believes in him. Does that hit you? So I, I was trying to take a familiar passage that seems very obvious and yet in my study, seeing new things and wanting them to learn new things. There's a danger if people leave Sunday morning, shake your hand, Pastor, and say, wow, Pastor, I don't know how you got that out of that verse. That was amazing. <laughs> wow. I did not see that. That was really cool. Now, it's one thing if they say, I didn't see that before, but now I see it. But you don't want them leaving just thinking, you're really smart. I never could have saw that. You want them leaving saying, how, how did I not see that before? And the other danger is our study is at a superficial level that what we're giving people, and it maybe had lots of affection and lots of stories and lots of connection, and yet 
we're not teaching them anything that they couldn't have found after 60 seconds of reading the text for themselves. We must engage our people as whole people with their passions, with their affections. But as Lloyd-Jones would say, that must come, first of all, through the mind. Not that understanding always comes and then affections follow. Sometimes you you have affections that then you have to understand what those affections are. But over the long haul, don't take the shortcut. Don't take the shortcut of just stirring people up in a way that bypasses intellectual engagement. That's like feeding people a diet of Skittles. I really like Skittles. And people from the church know that I like them. They'll give them to me. And they're, they're, that's easy. I mean, you, you take one of those, and this is a, you know, fruity kind of colorful candy that kids eat and, and pastors. And you eat it. It's not hard to, to think that's good on one first or whatever your candy is, chocolate. Or so, but it's not a diet. You have to train people to like better things, to be fed on better foods. And so engage their minds. Logic on fire. So do people know when they leave your expositional preaching more about the text or just more about you, about themselves, and about the world? Fourth, and I have, how many do I have? I have just six. So number four, we can get this wrong if we major on the trajectory of the text over the text itself. We major on the trajectory of the text over the text itself. Let me try to say this carefully so as not to alienate my own department and other seminary departments. I teach systematic theology. I love systematic theology. I read systematic theology in my spirit. I think systematic theology should inform all of our preaching so that you don't go off the rails. I am a firm believer And I would even say systematic theology should inform your exegesis because the best systematic theology is pulling together the whole counsel of God. Now, having said that, we must not let systematic categories and debates dominate our exposition as much as we like those categories. So if you are preaching on, let the little children come to me, it should not end up this morning's sermon, 10 Reasons for Infant Baptism. Now, I preached on that, and I made a connection as a good Presbyterian for why this might be Jesus' welcoming of the children, and so you make connections as you see appropriate, but not that text is not a sermon about baptism. You can make suggestions, you can make inferences, but do not let your systematic categories determine your text, that is, your, so if you're preaching, another example, you're preaching through one of the warning passages in Hebrews. Now, you got a good doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. You want to use that. So you want to you say, I'm not saying this, and here's how it fits together, and, and we're not becoming unjustified. All of that's good and proper. And yet, if you turn one of the warning passages into a sermon that's something other than a warning, now from Hebrews 6 this morning, four reasons we believe in the preservation of the saints. Make sure they got the guardrails. But then you ought to preach to them a warning. Do you really belong to God? Were you once enlightened? Taste of the holy things, and now you've spit them out of your mouth. So don't let systematic categories. And likewise, this can happen with biblical theology. By that I mean a a redemptive historical hermeneutic. I am all for redemptive historical preaching if that means connecting the Old Testament to the New Testament. We read the Old Testament in light of the New Testament. We have seen more than they were able to see in the Old Testament. We have seen Christ. But I'm not for redemptive historical preaching if it means every Old Testament sermon ends up sounding the same. I preached through Leviticus maybe 10 years ago, and you can't preach through Leviticus without going to Hebrews early and often. I'm preaching on Sunday evening right now through Daniel. And uh, two weeks ago, I did Daniel chapter 7. Well, of course, you're going to talk about the Son of Man and make some connection to Jesus' favorite self-designation as the Son of Man. But I hope I haven't preached the first six chapters of Daniel in a formulaic way. 
where chapter one or chapter two, Jesus is the better Nebuchadnezzar and then he's the angel in the fire and then he's the better Belshazzar. Chapter one, he's the better vegetables. Then he's the better Daniel. He's the better lion and just on and on and on. Every single sermon sounds the same. The first time you do that for your people, it's like, wow, whoa, whoa, so cool. You're right. We, we, we got commands. We can't do commands, but we have Jesus, and he does it. Oh, it's amazing. Second time, oh, that was cool. Third time, is this happening again? <laughs> and every sermon starts to sound the same. It becomes, where's Waldo? Just <laughs> Jesus hiding some, I believe, uh, wholeheartedly preaching Christ as he on the road to Emmaus showed how he was in all of the scriptures. But we don't do it in a formulaic way. It's a whole Christ who says lots of things and accomplished lots on our behalf. So there are lots of ways to make a beeline to Christ. So we don't want this to turn into a formulaic way where every sermon ends up sounding the same. Which leads to my fifth point. And uh, whenever I talk about preaching, I try to make this point. Maybe you've heard me say this in other contexts before. We can get this wrong if we... Give people the meaning of the text without the mood of the text. We miss the mood of the text. This is where I think many of us get just a little off step. Every text gets flattened because of our upbringing, our personality, our issues, or our homiletical model. There are some preachers... And they, the, the kind of preaching they resonated with and, and they love is the sort of grab you by the scruff of your neck and, you know, that sort of coach who says, what are you doing? And just throws you back out there and you think every sermon needs to end like that. And then there are the pastors who feel like everyone, every Sunday is very hurt, very on the edge of tears and needs a big Jesus bear hug. Well, if you are paying attention to the meaning and the mood, you understand that there's lots of texts. There's lots of medicines for sin-sick souls. So don't think every sermon must reach the, the heights of glory. Some sermons are in a valley. When I first started preaching, I felt, I, and I put it on myself, such pressure to kind of re-up from the next sermon to the next sermon. And so bigger and bigger and so you end one sermon and you got to get the idols out of your life and why are you watching so much TV and then the next week it's and you you still have your TVs and <laughs> your TVs are bigger now and you just just everything is up 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 you feel like every sermon has to be a a home run I already use a baseball analogy you know, I, I had a, a, a parishioner in my last church, and she was very good friends with my wife, so she could say this to me, but she'd say, good sermon, Pastor, it was a double. <laughs> or, you know, you leaned into one, you got hit by a pitch, but you're on base, so that was, but we sort of feel like every sermon is, is the, the best, biggest you, you need to take that pressure off yourself, and more importantly, you need to pay it such attention to the text that you're not making every text fit your desired ending and your desired personality so that every sermon is a stirring exhortation, every sermon assumes people feel bad about themselves, or every sermon assumes people really need to feel worse about themselves. The mood, maybe you heard me give these examples before, but they're appropriate. Uh, if you're preaching through Psalm 23... There's a mood. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I've got green pastures and the rod and the staff and they comfort me. That, the mood of that sermon ought to be a comfort for weary sheep and hungry sheep and hurting sheep. You turn it into a different kind of message. There's a good shepherd out there. Why don't you follow him? <laughs> what kind of sheep are you? He's got green pastures, you won't eat it. <laughs> his rod and his staff, and you're bucking against his staff. He has some of the worst sheep. That's not really the mood. <laughs> now, most of you wouldn't do that, but how about another text? How about 2 Samuel chapter 11, David's sin with Bathsheba? Now, I get it. 
um, you you, you want to great David's greater son and where do we find forgiveness for this and he's the king that failed uh, I, I would make those connections but but there's a mood there and the mood is the thing David had done displeased the Lord and so I hope if I'm preaching through that there's a mood that sin displeases God and I don't want to so pull the punch and run away from that or let the good redemptive historical stuff I want to do overshadow that, that the mood of that text becomes the mood of like any other text. And that mood is the same as the Lord is our shepherd. And isn't it good news that even though we sin and even though we may commit adultery, that God forgives us? Of course, there's, there's, there's a message there that needs to be said, but, but the mood to fall on the congregation, I think, in that text is it's a fearful thing if you're living in this sin that David didn't see. Some of you are, you, are you living in sin that you think no one sees? The Lord sees. The Lord knows. And you may be going to church and you may be here and you may put, put a big fat tithe check in there and yet the way you're living your life is displeasing to the Lord. I want people to feel that. I want to preach the mood. We flatten text. We get nervous sometimes about exhortations, imperatives. Jesus says, he, te- he told the parable of the persistent widow, and it says right there in the text, so that they would pray and never give up. It's right there. If your sermon isn't about praying and not giving up, then you really missed it. So most would get nervous. Well, you know, maybe the sermon's about, well, none of us really pray that as the way that we should, but Jesus is he's a high priest and intercedes for us, and we're never going to pray as much as we should, but praise God, Jesus is there to pray. Oh, that's true. Do that from Romans. This sermon, there's a parable here so that you keep praying. Keep praying. Don't give up. Of course, it's not just a force of the will. You, you would pull out from that passage, you know, what sort of father he is and what's the motivation for it. Preach the meaning and the mood. So finally, how, how, how do we fall short of this? How do we fail in expository preaching? Here's my last point. We can fall short of expository preaching because sometimes we're not actually preaching. What do I mean by that? Well, think of my definition. Expository preaching gives people the meaning of the text and what to do with it. When Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, do you get the sense that preaching is a big deal? Do you get the sense that preaching involves more than a running commentary? More than the fruits of your exegesis? I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing and his kingdom preach the word. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. That's what good preaching does. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience in teaching. There is no form of preaching that does not carry with it authority. There's no way to separate the two. What what did they say about Jesus after the Sermon on the Mount? They marveled. Why? Because he was so smart, because he was really warm, because he was a great storyteller, because he understood the culture, because he was very funny. Why did they marvel? They marveled because he spoke as one who had authority, not as the scribes. Now, authority is not by just dint of your personality. Some people are very loud. Some people are more subdued. When I read older preaching, I'm often struck and humbled to consider how far short my own preaching falls, struck by the directness of the preaching. It's especially true, I think, 18th century preaching and revival, awakening preaching, the directness to the congregation, imploring them, calling them. It's what Lloyd-Jones would say is the difference between being an advocate and being a witness or preaching about the gospel and preaching the gospel. To preach about the gospel is a wonderful thing, is to tell your people there is a Savior. 
God the Father sent his son to be a savior for sinful people. And whoever would repent and follow him and believe in him and trust in him alone can have their sins forgiven. And this day can be assured of eternal life. That's all true. You do that in a sermon. But do you ever turn from preaching, here's how the gospel works, to preaching the gospel into people's lives and hearts? Where you do maybe walk out from the pulpit or you lean over and you say, listen, every single person in this room is a sinner. Some of you know it, some of you don't. Some of you are sinners saved by grace. Some of you are sinners who think you can be saved some other way. Some of you have been going to church your whole life and you think that that's enough. And it's not. George Whitfield said you can sooner climb to the moon on a rope of sand than you can be justified by your own works. You need a Savior. You need Him now. That, do you preach like that? That's preach. That's telling them, you, you need the gospel. I've told our people many times, and I exhort our students the same, may it never be that anyone in your congregation or my congregation can stand before God someday and say, no one ever told me I needed a Savior. Or never, no one ever told me there was a judgment to come. No one ever told me that there was danger. I, 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 never, I never heard it. Now, people don't always hear what we say, but you need to be that faithful watchman on the walls. So I wonder if sometimes... In our efforts to be faithful expositors, we are doing more exposition than we are doing preaching. Of course, the two go hand in hand, but there is some biblical precedence for the distinction I'm making. Paul says in 2 Timothy 1.11, he calls himself a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher. A kerux, an apostolos, and a didaskalos. They are not all identical, though they overlap. To be a kerux is to be a herald. To say, hear ye, hear ye, I have a message from King Jesus. The k is not the leader of an inductive Bible study, as important as those are. He is not engaged in an interactive dialogue, though there ought to be times for that in the church. He is not simply giving testimony to what the Lord has done in his life. He is a herald. One of the most important confessions that we never talk about from the Reformation is the Second Helvetic Confession, 1566, written by Heinrich Bullinger, who was for the Swiss church, was widely accepted. And it has for one of its chapters this title, The Preaching of the Word of God is the Word of God. Here's what it says. Wherefore, when this Word of God is now preached in the church by preachers lawfully called, we believe that the very Word of God is proclaimed and received by the faithful, and that neither any other word of God is to be invented nor is to be expected from heaven, and that now the word itself which is preached is to be regarded, not the minister that preaches, for even if he be evil and a sinner, nevertheless the word of God remains still and true. Do you believe that the preaching of the word of God is the very word of God? I think First Peter chapter 1 tells us that it is. I think it was Lloyd-Jones, though when you get to be as famous as he, lots of ideas get, if you want it to sound good, Lloyd-Jones said it. I think Lloyd-Jones said something like this, that by the end of his sermon, he would hope that people were, that were no longer taking notes. You know, you, the beginning of the sermon, you're getting, oh, oh, who, who are the kings in Babylon? I'm going to write that down. And wh when was the fall there? And what was the city? And Oh, describe to me again, Pastor, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. I don't want to write that down. And you're writing down, and you're writing down the three points, and people are taking notes. And by the end of the sermon, you hope that it's quiet. Now, part of it is just strategy. If you're bringing up, you know, finer points of exegesis in your conclusion, then you're, you've not planned things. You're not pacing things correctly. But it's also a sense that you're going for, as Lloyd-Jones said, a sense of the weight of, of God and His glory. That no longer are, are, are people thinking about the football game's about to start and I got to get the roast on and I want to jot that down. They know that Christ is speaking to them. May I decrease, may Christ increase. And so they listen and the sheep know his 
voice. So perhaps I can add a final clause to my definition. In expository preaching, our people understand the text, know what to do with it, because they have heard from the Lord Jesus. All of our studies, all of our careful attention, all of our prayers and longing and failings and strugglings are to that end. Oh God, I, I pray this often, and it's not at all, I hope, feigned humility. I will say, oh Lord, by your Spirit, working through the Word, by the voice of Jesus, would these people hear a better sermon than the one I'm about to preach? God will do His work through the Word. Let us be faithful. Let me pray. Our Father in heaven, we give thanks for these brothers and sisters, their patience, their energy, their willingness to think on these things. Uh, Lord, you know that as much as anyone, all the help that I need as a preacher, as a pastor, as a Christian, as a man. So start with me, Lord, and, and work in me and work in each one here, whether our role is as a Bible study leader, as student, as discipler of children or women, or whether it is to be that man lawfully called and ordained to preach the Word of God Sunday by Sunday from the pulpit. Help us to be faithful handlers of the Word, that our people may hear the very voice of Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen.